Thank all of the children and youth that participated in the service this morning. Today, the day in which we, Jesus, would have been preparing ultimately to go to the cross. And some of you may, may question, why do they call it the triumphal entry if Christ ultimately was being led to the cross? If by the end of the week, people would be crying out, crucify him. Why would that be considered a triumphal entry? Well, let me tell you what I've concluded. As we look at this and we study the scripture and we understand that ultimately Jesus entered into the city as a king and was welcomed as perhaps a savior, by the end of the week he would die on the cross, but the triumph came on the third day. The triumph, Jesus came and he conquered death and sin and he conquered the grave. If Paul writes, and, and I'm going to turn turn with me to 1 Thessalonians, but I want to read to you just a couple of verses out of 1 Corinthians. Paul says in verse 14 of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians, he says, And if Christ be not risen, then, I, then is our preaching vain, and your faith also is vain. In verse 26 of that same chapter, Paul writes these words, The last enemy that shall be destroyed is death. In verse 27, For he hath put all things under his feet, but when he saith all things are put under him, it is manifest that he is accept, expect, accepted, which did put all things under him. And when all things shall be subdued unto him, then shall the Son also himself be subject unto him that put all things under him, that God may be all in all. We need to understand ultimately that Jesus gives us the victory. In verse 58 of 1 Corinthians chapter 15, but thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through Jesus Christ our Lord. You see, the triumphal entry was triumphant not because, not because of the crowd. It was triumphant not because of the government. It was triumphant not because of those who would falsely accuse Jesus, but it was triumphant because when Jesus would cry out these three words on the cross, it is finished. He had presented the final sacrifice for our sins, that is, the shedding of his precious blood. And when he rose from the tomb, He showed us that we can be triumphant as well. That we can win the victory. That victory over sin and death is given to us through the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to continue this morning. We're going to wrap up the series in 1 Thessalonians. And next Sunday on Easter Sunday morning, I want to encourage you to be here. Uh, we're going to, we are going to talk about the crucifixion next week. Some things that took place there. But in 1 Thessalonians, I want us to begin reading in verse 13 of chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians. Then we're going to read in chapter 5, verses 1 through 10. I want us to address this morning the redeemed saint. I've kind of had a, a theme throughout the first the, the, the series on 1 Thessalonians. And this morning, last week we talked about the sanctified saint. This morning we're going to talk about the redeemed saint. The word redeem in the Bible often brings about the idea of payment being made ultimately to purchase one's freedom. When we talk about redemption, the redemption that comes through the blood of Jesus Christ, it is the price that he paid for the debt that we owe. Therefore, we can truly proclaim that we have been redeemed. We've been redeemed from the curse of sin, which is the law. We've been redeemed from the penalty of sin, which is death. And therefore, we have been granted eternal life. If you know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, you truly can proclaim, I have been redeemed. There's an old hymn that we used to sing, redeem, redeem, redeem by the blood of the Lamb. In 1 Thessalonians, Jesus, uh, Paul, along with Silvanus and Timothy, they, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy, they've traveled, we know, that. Uh, Paul has written this letter uh, to the church at Thessalonica and in verse 13 I want you to notice that word in the King James English is but we know that it's ultimately 
Paul has pointed out some interesting facts just previously to this statement. And, and when, we, when we come to verse 13, Paul begins to expound even more and he begins to add to, and the word but, ultimately, we can look at the word but as a, as a not necessarily a contradictory statement, but it's in opposition to perhaps something that the Thessalonians were going through. And as we read these chapters and read these verses, we understand that Paul perhaps was addressing the issue that many of them had feared or were living in fear because they had had dear departed loved ones or, or church members or brothers or sisters in the faith who had perhaps died as a result of the, the persecution had died, had been martyred for their faith. And so there was a little bit of uncertainty perhaps in the mind of these Thessalonians. And so Paul wants to comfort them and wants to encourage them to understand, listen, death and grave is not the end for the same, for those who've been redeemed. So in verse 13, Paul begins this way, but I would not have you to be ignorant. Some other translations, the American Standard Version, uh, uh, the New American Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, uh, or the ESV rather, puts that phrase, I would not have you to be in, uninformed. Uninformed. In other words, Paul is fixing to give us some information that is very, very important to us in regards to, uh, uh, in regards to those who have gone before us. He says, but I would not have you to be ignorant or uninformed, brethren, concerning them which are asleep, that ye sorrow not, even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent or precede them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. I want to stop right there and we'll have a word of prayer. Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for the promise, for the hope, for the redemption that we have through your son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you for the future that we have in your kingdom. And Lord, we pray today that there be anyone here who does not know you as Lord and Savior. Lord, that you would speak to their hearts and your spirit would draw them to you. Lord, that they might be saved and that they might be forgiven. That their citizenship might be removed from this earth and written down in heaven. Lord, lead us and guide us today. We pray your will be done. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now we're going to read some verses in chapter 5 in just a moment. But there are some things here I want us to consider in these, in these very few verses, in this short passage that we've read. But I would not have you to be uninformed. Or some of the older translations, one of the older translations. But we would not have you to be uninformed. In other words, he's relating back to himself and Silvanus and Timothy. And the, the topic, the topic concerns those who are asleep. In the Bible, we know that the word sleep or, or asleep or sleeping, oftentimes we think of nap time. But in the Bible, most of the time, it refers to those who have suffered, who have suffered death. Who have suffered death. And so Paul is pointing out and he's giving some facts, and, if you will, some statistics concerning the natural body and the process of death and for those who are redeemed, the everlasting life or the resurrection that they, ha that they have. So I want us to consider this for just a moment. The resurrected redeemed. The resurrected redeemed. So when, when Paul writes these words, when he, when he tries to convey the message concerning those which are asleep, and we need to understand that some translations change the perfect participle, them who have fallen asleep and they continue to sleep, when Paul writes those who are concerning them which are asleep, he's talking about those who have died and those who perhaps continue to be dead. But as I said, some translations ch change that perfect participle under the present, them that fall asleep. In other words, those who die. 
reminded of a couple of different scripture passages. One, for instance, comes from the 8th chapter of the book of uh, the Gospel of Luke. Concerning the, the ruler of the synagogue and his daughter. Now, we know elsewhere in some of the other Gospels, that's Jairus and his daughter. And we know that he came to Jesus and he begged Jesus that he would come and to heal his daughter. And in the process of Jesus going to Jairus' house or this rich, this synagogue's ruler's house, <coughs> some approached him and said, your daughter's dead. Your daughter has died. She's no longer among the living. But I want you to look in verse 52 of chapter 8 of the Gospel of Luke. Jesus says these words. Or it says these words. And all wept and bewailed her. But he said, this is Jesus. But he said, weep not. She is not dead, but sleepeth. Weep not. She is not dead, but sleepeth. You see, there's a difference between being dead. Death, obviously, is a separation from the living. There's a difference between being dead in sin and being asleep in Jesus. You know, think about this. We who are asleep, or those who are asleep in Jesus, are alive unto eternal life. I've often shared it at funeral services that I've done that, you know, for the Christian, for the Christian, God often uses the process of death as the usher, the ushering of us into heaven. Now, Paul is writing to the church at Thessalonica, and remember, Paul is anticipatory. He is anticipating the imminent return of Christ, which is perhaps very soon to him, but it's also very soon to us. As the Holy Spirit inspired Paul to write here, we must understand that, listen, it could happen at any moment. Jesus could come back. And so just as the Thessalon Thessalonians were perhaps worried about those who were already dead, seeing the Lord, Paul writes these words to comfort them. But he also writes these words to prepare them. You see, we need to be prepared to meet the Lord at any moment. But in the context, Paul is writing concerning the resurrected redeemed. And he's pointing out the hope. The hope. The hope that they have. And it's not a hope, it's simply a, a wish or wishful thinking, but it's a hope. That's sure, that's certain, that's sealed. In the 11th chapter of the Gospel of John, we find it in some of the other Gospels as well, we see the story of Lazarus, one of Jesus' friends. Jesus has heard that his friend Lazarus is sick. That perhaps many who, who were there surrounding him, both his sisters and his friends and his relatives and his neighbors, who were there perhaps praying over him day and night. and They're living a life of uncertainty, not knowing whether or not Lazarus is going to succumb to death or whether Lazarus, God is going to choose to heal him and raise him from his sickness. But we learn that Jesus waited. He waited for four days before he entered back into Bethany, the home town of Lazarus and Mary and Martha. Prior to his arrival, he tells the, the, the disciples, he says, Our friend Lazarus sleepeth, but I go and I may, that I may awake him out of sleep. You see, Lazarus had hope. And it was a hope that, cert, that was certain. And the statement that Jesus makes in John in chapter 11, the last part of verse 11. He says, listen, I'm gonna, right now Lazarus is dead. But I'm going to go and give Lazarus life. I'm going to awake him from death. So Lazarus had hope. And you know what? You and I have hope as well. Our hope rests in nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. 
from which we have the redemption of our sins. The second thing I want to point out in regards to those who have gone, who have fallen asleep, not only did they have hope, but they also take precedence over us who are alive and remain. You see, as God ushers the dead into his presence, they beat us there. They beat us there. Notice what he says. Skip on down to verse 15 in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. For this we say unto you, by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain in the coming of the Lord shall not, the King James Version uses the word prevent, other translations use the word proceed, them which are asleep. In other words, <clears throat> their resurrection takes precedence over our rapture. Their entry into the presence of the Lord. Some perhaps takes, takes place long before we ever see the Lord. You know, there is comfort. There is comfort in those, in those who are going through bereavement. In those who are going through mourning for their dear departed loved ones who have died, who have ceased from living, who have been separated from us in this world. But Paul says, listen, they're not without hope. As a matter of fact, they have hope. A certain hope. They don't have to wait because their entry into the kingdom of heaven it takes precedence over our entry into the kingdom of heaven. Elsewhere we find the apostles declaring to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Remember we close out this chapter with these words. Therefore comfort one another with these words. Paul is trying to comfort those Thessalonians who had questions concerning the afterlife. Concerning those who have died before them. He points them to the hope that they have in Jesus Christ. He points them to the precedence that they have over we who are alive and remain. Thirdly, he points them to the resurrection. Look with me in verses 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first. Some have pointed out and some have come to the conclusion that Jesus is specifically speaking here of the bodily resurrection from the tomb. You know, I've had discussions with many, many people throughout the times that I've been pastoring churches. And there are even a lot of Christians who have trouble uh, understanding the resurrection. Some say, well, it's not a bodily resurrection, it's a spiritual resurrection. That we simply become as the angels and we gain our wings. Folks, let me tell you something. If your dear departed loved one has gone into heaven, it's not because God needed another angel. It's because Jesus had prepared a place for them to worship him and fellowship with him. They are not, they are not, they do not become angels. <coughs> God created angels and he created men. Just as Jesus was bodily resurrected from the tomb, that is, he was a physical being, so they will be resurrected from the tomb. They will receive a glorified body. I had a person tell me one time, well, what's God need a body like this for with all these scars and all these sicknesses and all these diseases? No. No. You see, they will be resurrected from the grave just as Jesus was in the same way. They will receive a glorified body. Jesus told Mary, Mary, don't touch me, don't cling to me, for I have not yet ascended into my, to my Father. And then yet he told, the, he told Thomas, he said, Thomas, look here, here's my, here's, feel my hands. Thrust your hand into my side. Jesus was a physical body, but he was not suffering. He was not suffering physical diseases. Perhaps he still bore the scars that came through living and life and the crucifixion upon the cross. But he did not suffer the penalty of sin. 
which is death. This old body, and I know that this is kind of a kind of a hard thought for people to think about. We think about babies and infants being born and we think how cute and cuddly and how innocent they are. But the fact is this, is that from the moment of birth, we are born in sin. We are dead in sin. And so from the moment that that infant is born, they are headed to the grave. Except for the grace of of God. Paul points out to the Thessalonians through faith in Christ and the fact that he was raised from the dead. It gives us hope that those who have departed before us will be raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Receiving a glorified body and taking presence over we who are alive and remain. Which brings me to the second point. Paul writes concerning those who, who are or who consist of the remaining redeemed. You see, there are the redeemed who are in heaven today. And there are the redeemed who have yet to see heaven. That would be us, those who are born again believers, who are alive and remain on this earth, who, who have been given a purpose in this world to proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. Church's sole purpose today, listen, if God didn't have a purpose for the New Testament church, we wouldn't be here today. The purpose of the New Testament church is to go and to preach and teach and to make disciples. To prepare people for their eternal home. That they might escape eternal judgment. And so Paul writes, not only concerning those who have gone on before us, but also those of us who remain. That is those of us who still live and breathe and function in this world. Those who have been given the, the, the purpose of Propagating the gospel of preaching and teaching and witnessing and testifying. But he also points out the fact that we who are alive and remain will not always be here in this place. We'll not always be in this form. It points to those who are remaining redeemed. They will be raptured. And, you know, I've had many people tell me through the years, well, that word rapture is not in the Bible. No, it's not. But the definition is. The word rapture comes from the Latin word raptura. Raptura. Literally, the word raptura in the Latin means to be snatched away. Which points to the fact that when the church, and if you read here in verse 17, it says, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Caught up. Shall be caught up. The Latin Vulgate uses the word raptura. It literally means to snatch away, to seize. To pluck, to pull, to take, ultimately to take by force is the implication. Describes the irresistible power with which the saints shall be caught up out of this world. I don't know about you, but I look forward to that day. I've often shared with you concerning the imminence of Christ's return. In other words, it is irreversible. Christ is coming back. He's coming back with the redeemed who have preceded us into his presence. He's coming back for the redeemed who are alive and remain. But listen, 
He's not going to leave them here on this earth in this old rotten place that is so sin sick. Ultimately, it's leading to self destruction. You know, I've got to admit, I'm a little skeptical about all of these scientists and their equations about concerning global warming. But I've got to admit, it's true. It's true. Well, preacher, how could you, how could you stand beside, behind the pulpit and say that all of these scientists with all of their calculations and all of this concerning global warming and stand there and proclaim the gospel and say that these scientists have come up and devised a plan and a timeline regarding the destruction of this earth and are blaming it all on us. How could you say that's true? Well, listen, I didn't say their timing was correct. And I didn't say that there was anything you or I could do to change it. But I can tell you this. The scripture says that one of these days this earth is going to be destroyed by fire. You think it ain't going to be hot? One degree difference over 30 or 40 or 50 or 60 years ain't going to be a drop in the bucket as to what's coming. And this world is deceitfully growing dim. But for we which are alive and remain, we shall be caught up, raptured out, taken away, snatched out, seized to meet them. Who's them? Those who perceived us in death. And the Lord in the air. What a great, great reunion day. What a great reunion day that will be. We will be reunited with the saints before us, who have gone before us. And we will be united face to face with our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But none of this can happen without the return of Christ. You see, there's a resurrected redeemed, there are the remaining redeemed, but redemption doesn't mean anything unless Jesus comes back. Unless Jesus comes back. Look with me in verse 14. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them which also sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. That word bring is an active verb. It's an active verb. Notice the word will God bring with him. In other words, it, it denotes that, listen, there's some action on the part of God and, and the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's pointing this, he's pointing in regards to his return concerning those who are alive. Look with me in verse 16. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. Secondly, concerning the return of Christ. We find it in regards to his appearing, his appearance. Jesus is not going to send simply those dear departed saints back here. No. But he's coming in person. He's coming in person. The Lord from of whom we cannot see, but we accept on faith. The Lord that we cannot touch, and yet he lives. The Lord who willingly submitted himself to the suffering of the cross on our behalf. And yet now, his body 
has been glorified. And when he comes back, he comes back with the grand announcement. Just as Palm Sunday, they cried out, Hosanna. The trumpet will blow and the voice of the archangel will sound. The king has arrived! The judge is here. In modern day courtrooms, it's customary for when the judge enters into the courtroom for the bailiff to stand and say, all rise, all rise. We do that in a modern wedding ceremony as a show of respect for the bride. The pastor will often stand before the congregation as the bridal procession begins and say, all rise. At the appearing, at the appearing of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, <laughs> let me tell you something. We will not rise in pride. Many will stand in judgment, but all will kneel and proclaim that Jesus Christ is Lord. He might not be their Lord, but every knee shall bow and every tongue confess that Jesus is Lord, which points us thirdly to his authority. I told you we we're going to read some verses out of 1 Thessalonians in chapter 5. Turn with me there real quickly. Beginning in verse 1, it says this. But of the times and of the seasons, brethren, we, ye have no need that I write unto you, for yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so cometh as a thief in the night. For when they shall say, Peace and safety, then sudden destruction cometh upon them as travail, cometh upon a woman with child, and they shall not escape. Did you hear that? But ye, brethren, there's that word but again, are not in darkness that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're all the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of the darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as do others, but let us watch and be sober. For they that sleep, sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunken in the night. Remember I said that most of the time in the Bible the word sleeps points to the fact of death, points to the bodily death. But here, it's pointing to those who are spiritually dead. Those who are spiritually dead. Those who are living in riotousness and wantonness. Those who are dead in sin. Not the redeemed, remember, because we've had the price for our sins paid. The redemption. And so Paul writes and he says, you're children of light. You've been taken out of that darkness. In verse 8 he says, but let us who are of the day be sober, alert, aware, watching. Putting on the breastplate of faith and love and for a helmet the hope of salvation. For, by the way, that's part of the armor of God. In verse 9, for God hath not appointed us under wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Get this. Who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Whether we are alive and remain, or we have gone to be the, with the Lord, we will be with him. A couple of things I want to point out in regard to this and we'll close. First of all, the announcement of his coming. The announcement of his coming. It's not a pastor. It's not someone out on the street corner. It's not a hobo. But the announcement of his coming comes from heaven. You know why? Because there's not a man on this earth that knows when Jesus is coming back. Secondly, 
Second, there's the announcement of his coming. <coughs> but second, there's the certainty of his coming. The certainty of his coming. It do, Paul doesn't say that if Jesus comes back, he uses the word when Jesus, in the English, when Jesus appears. When, when, when. There's the announcement, there's the certainty. Thirdly, kind of brings up the third point up here concerning his authority. But thirdly, in verse 10 of chapter 5, it reminds us that Jesus died for us. Jesus died for us. That whether we wake, in other words, whether we are alive, or whether we are asleep, that is, asleep in Jesus, dead to the living, but alive to the Lord. We should live together with him. The authority of which Jesus comes is pointed out to us concerning the announcement. The announcement. The certainty. The certainty. Friends, do you know him today? Paul, <coughs> like many of the gospel writers, understood the imminence of Jesus' coming. All they could do was speculate on when that timing would be. I'm convinced that just as Jesus comes in authority and certainty, that he could come at any moment. That's what the scripture says. And that we need to be looking for him. Every day, every minute, every moment. Because the king is coming. The king is coming. Hosanna. <laughs> Hosanna to the king of kings. He's coming. Do you know him today? Do you know him today? You see, if you don't know him today, you have reason to be worried. Because there will be no resurrection to the eternal kingdom of heaven for those who don't know him as Lord and Savior of their life. There is no title, including the word redeemed for those who are lost and dead in sin. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus, It's by grace through faith you're saved. By grace through faith you're saved. I can tell you this. If you place your faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, your Savior, today, you will be saved. And from that day forward, you'll be prepared to meet him in eternal glory because you know his, his coming is in his certain. Christian friend, you know, we, we bewail and we mourn many times our loved ones. 21st of March, made a year since my stepmother passed away. And you know what? I miss her. <coughs> April the 9th, April the 9th will mark three years my mama's past has been gone from this earth. You know what? I miss her. 
But Paul tells us, for those who are, are dead to sin, are alive to Christ, that one of these days, <laughs> we'll see them again. We'll see them again. My hope and my prayer is that your kinfolks are prepared to meet the Lord. Not just your kinfolks, but you. But you as well. 55-year-old man passed away just this week. 55 years old. Listen, I'm going on 58. I'm going on 58. Some of you are, the Lord has blessed you with many years beyond what the scripture says is God's promise. Three score and ten, just seventy. Yep, God's left you here for a reason. Some of you are much younger than I am. God continues to leave you here for a reason. Perhaps part of the reason God is leaving us all here that we can continue to do his will and tell people about the gospel and the way to be saved. Some of you, perhaps, who are still alive and remaining on this earth, perhaps it is because you have to totally surrender your life to Jesus Christ. How will you answer that call on your life to be saved? How will you answer that call in your life to have hope? How will you answer that call in your life to be vigilant? Be vigilant in your daily walk with Him. Let's stand together this morning. God has spoken to your heart. How will you respond? <clears throat> Our Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to be saved. We thank you, Lord, for the gospel message, for Jesus and his sacrifice. We thank you for the certainty of his coming and for the authority by which he comes. And Lord, for the purpose. Lord, we thank you for those place, that place that you prepared for those who know you as Lord and Savior. And Lord, we pray your will be done today for those who don't. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.